I'd like for you to take the Word of God and open it, if you would, to two different passages. Firstly, we go to Ephesians chapter 5, and then go to 1 Corinthians 12. So, Ephesians chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians 12. I'm going to do something I don't, don't normally do, and that is we're going to have a, a jumping off point from these texts, which generally I like to park somewhere and you know, just try to mine the riches that are in one text. We won't be doing that this evening. As you know, this year we have entitled the Year of the Disciple, and we're working on what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so we're starting a series. If you saw the bulletin board when you came in, um, I want to say thank you to Luke and Sophia for putting that together. But it's meaningful membership rediscovering the joy of belonging and that's what we're doing in this series and so I think I have 18 different lessons that we're going to go through 18 different messages and my goal is to produce a new members type of class for Emmanuel Baptist Church we've had people join here um, and I have failed to properly introduce people into what it means to be a local New Testament church, what it means to be a Christian in a church, and I want to produce something that we can replicate when folks come our way. I don't know if you remember last year I preached when the Supreme Court decided to overturn Roe v. Wade. I preached a message, make this valley full of ditches. And we want to talk about building structures that prepare for the blessing of God. And this is one of the things I feel compelled to do. And I want to start with church Membership, And so the lesson for this uh, first, or the title for this first message in Meaningful Membership, Rediscovering the Joys of Belonging, the title is just simply, What is Church Membership? So if you're taking notes, what is church membership? There are a lot of problems facing church membership in our day, and three of them could fall into these different categories. The first is, that we live in a day when there are very soft barriers to entry. Or we could say there are very low levels to entry or to membership in a church. There are people who have attended here for a short time, and they say just because they've attended this church for several weeks, well, that's my church. And I've had to speak to people and say, no, Emmanuel Baptist Church is not your pastor or your church, and I am not your pastor. Because these are people who have not submitted themselves to membership. They don't really want to join. They don't really want to have any authority over their lives. But they have this idea that, well, if that's the church that I go to semi-regularly, I am a member there. And there are lots of evangelical churches that affirm that. You know, well, you call this church your church home. This is church for you. And there's just low or soft barriers to membership. Just come and this is your church, that kind of thing. Uh, also, the radical individualistic nature of our culture is a problem. The radically individualistic, self-determining nature of our society is a huge problem. I've had people sit and they look at me with a straight face and say, well, I'm thinking about coming over and joining your church. Um, as though, and what they imply by that is, they could simply join the church by a matter of will. Well, I want to be a part of your church, therefore I get to be a part of the church. Here's what that, where that comes from. That comes from someone having the assumption that they can dictate what a church says or does from the outside. That is a dangerous thing, but again, evangelical churches can largely be blamed for this because they go into a culture and they have this seeker-sensitive idea and they say to the culture, well, what kind of music should we have? What kind of sermons should we have? What kind of church services, what ought our church services to look like? And it's shaped more by the non-members than it is by the members and worse and this is far worse, it's shaped more by the non-members than it is by the Word of God. And that's really a, uh, uh, an issue. And it's ridiculous, 
that a non-member would think that they have some say in our church. Uh, I've said at times to people, they say, well, you know, I'm, I think I'll just come and, and join at Emmanuel. And I have to clarify gently, I'd like for you to submit yourself for membership at Emmanuel. And there will be an evaluation if this person is qualified to join. And then there will be a vote if this person should be allowed to join. A third problem facing us today is this idea of the universal church superseding the reality of the visible church. Now, let me be plain. You would have to be a fool to deny the reality of the universal, invisible church. Jesus said, John 10, verse 16, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. There is a body of believers that will be gathered in Christ in the fullness of times, according to Ephesians verse, or chapter 1, verse 10. There is a family in which God is the Father and Christ is the elder brother, and all of us are born again into that family no matter what church you attend. There is a universal body, but there is no visible expression of the body of Christ in our dispensation outside the local New Testament church. Can you go to the universal church on the first day of the week and bring your tithes and offerings? You can't. How many people has the universal church baptized? Zero. Can the invisible body of Christ send missionaries? Where can you meet with the uh, universal invisible church for an assembly? Where else do we find elders who are given over to labor in the word and in the prayer closet for the flock? But these three issues I've just mentioned, soft barriers to membership, the radical individualistic nature of our culture, the idea of the universal church superseding the local church, are usually manifested by people saying, I'm a Christian, I believe in God and all that stuff, but I pray at home. And sometimes I read the Bible with my family in my house. Occasionally I attend church somewhere. Why would I need to be an accountable member of a local church somewhere? And so these are more excuses that people bring. And I hope to answer that question. So let's read our texts. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, the Apostle Paul says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And secondly, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 21 through 26. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. This is the word of the Lord. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, I ask that you would help us and, and cement some things in our hearts and minds tonight. Give us something that uh, we can carry that we can communicate to others but also lord help these dear folks and myself to see that our commitment to the local church is not in vain but it is obedience to our head help us to see that help us to value the church as you valued it to love the church as you loved the church and to give ourselves for her as you gave yourself for us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The first point is this. What is a church? What is a church? Now you would 
be hard pressed to find a specific passage that says the church is this. Generally, uh, the scripture gives us pictures when it comes to the church. The church is the body of Christ in the passage I just read. It's made up of many members. And there's one head, and the head communicates to the members how to love and to serve each other. The, the church is a building. and We are living stones built upon the foundation. Christ is the chief cornerstone, and the apostles and the prophets are the foundation. And we are living stones put together to build this building in which Christ, by his spirit, dwells. We're the bride of Christ. That is, we are purchased by him and we are wed to him and we enjoy eternal union and unity with him. And we are the branches and he is the vine and we are connected to Christ. And all these things are important. Biblically, as we look through scripture, um, there's a definition that I think is helpful and I'll give it to you. And over the next 18 weeks, well, 18 lessons, because we'll miss a few here and there for the Lord's Supper, we're going to dig into this, and I think you'll see from the Scripture that this is what a New Testament church is, though I won't have time to prove it all right now. I'll just give you a brief consideration. The church is a baptized body of born-again believers who voluntarily cling together to proclaim the gospel and keep Christ's ordinances. Let me give you that to you one more time. The church is a baptized body of born-again believers who voluntarily cling together to proclaim the gospel and keep Christ's ordinances. And there's more that could be said about each of these points. The church being a baptized body of born-again believers who voluntarily cling together to proclaim the gospel and keep the ordinances. But there's basically that's what a church is. Now, there are churches that do this very well. And there's still churches. There are churches that do that very poorly. And there's still churches. There are good churches. There's bad churches. And maybe we'd put it a better way. There are healthy churches and there are unhealthy churches. But there's still a church if these elements are there. Because there are different levels of health. There's different levels of maturity and growth. But just because a group gathers together for some religious sort of purpose does not give them the right to be a church in the New Testament, or to call themselves a church. In the New Testament, a church did specific things. The church of Jesus Christ did specific things. You know, a group of people may get together on Friday night for a Bible study and prayer, but that doesn't make them a church. It's wonderful that Christians gather and they read the Scripture and they pray, but that doesn't mean them a church. Jesus said that he was going to build his church, and a church is a body of people who do what he commanded them to do. Hey, bowling and Bible study and burgers would be a great way to spend Tuesday night, but that's not a church. Uh, people say where two or three are gathered together, you know, Jesus is there with them. Well, that's certainly true, but Jesus' idea of people gathering together was a church getting together for the purpose of performing the will of God. Um, Jesus said if we're not living in accordance to his word, uh, or we must be obedient to what he's called us to do. We cannot get our ideas of what church is from, uh, from popular culture. We must go to the scripture. A lot of the what's known as the Protestant Reformation revolved, we know about the five solas, I think most people know that, but what grew out of that was this radical reformation in society, in home, and in church. In the three spheres that God has ordained, civil society, the home, 
and the church, there was a massive reformation. In the 16th century, before the reformation occurred, the pop teaching was, and I think we need a reformation still today, back to what the Bible teaches, but the pop teaching was that the true church, the true church, and listen, whenever you hear people talk about the true church, they always want to go back like there is some sort of succession. Hey, the true church doesn't celebrate Christmas because do you know the origins of that? And they want to talk about this succession. The true church was wherever the Pope sat. There's an apostolic succession. Peter was given the keys to the church, and that was passed down. And, of course, there wasn't a pope for a long time, but then there was another one, you know, wonderful. This is exciting to them or whatever. Uh, it was a mess. We call this the Roman Catholic Church. And it was during that time God raised up men like Martin Luther, like, uh, I think, uh, Zwingli, John Calvin, these men to shine a light on what it means to be a Christian. Edmund Clowney, who's a great historian, he said this, quote, The Reformation made the gospel, not ecclesiastical organization, the test of the true church. What did you think about that? The Protestant Reformation made the gospel, not ecclesiastical organization, the test of of the true church consider what that's saying it's saying that obedience to christ obedience to the word of christ is more important than obedience to men you know often we think that a church needs a certain type of building needs to have a certain type of organization it's even possible to mention a church as a landmark you know we can still say well we have this church across the street from us even though you know believers don't gather there um but before we would say such and such place is a church, maybe we should ask ourselves, what do they believe about the gospel? What do they believe about Christ? What do they believe about the words of Christ? Anyone can paint the name church on the sign, but are they believing and teaching and practicing what Jesus Christ taught them? In the same way that a Tuesday night Bible study is not a church, if they're not doing the things that Christ calls a church to do, we shouldn't be willing to say that a sort of group of Bible study that meets in a sort of religious-looking building, we shouldn't be willing to say that's a church if they don't have the gospel, if they're not proclaiming the gospel and doing the things Christ ordered his church to do. John Calvin in his institutes, which no one reads, but they should, but they won't because they would rather believe what other people parrot about him. He said this, quote, Wherever we see the word of God purely preached and heard and the ordinances administered according to Christ's institution, there it is not to be doubted a church of God exists, end quote. That is is undeniably true wherever the true word of god is preached and heard important elements and the ordinances administered according to christ's institution there it is not to be doubted a church of god exists and that would be in a straw hut or in someone's living room or in a beautiful facility like god's given us here Thomas Cranmer, the unparalleled reformer, he wrote the 42 Articles of the Church of England. In Article 20, he said, quote, The visible church of Christ is a congregation of faithful men in which the pure word of God is preached and the sacraments duly administered according to Christ's ordinance, end quote. And here's their perspective, and I share it because I think it's apostolic. I think it's what Christ gave to us, and it's basically what we're going to see over the next 18 weeks. A church is where Christ is preached. His word is preached and not just preached. It is heard and his ordinances are performed. That's what a church is. It's very important. There's a lot of Bible behind this and we will get into it in the weeks to come. But we ought to understand just this. The church is the body for which Christ died. Therefore, they believe what he said. 
Think on this. The church is the body for which Christ died. Therefore, they believe what he said. And they do what he commands. The church is the body for which Christ died. Therefore, they believe what he said. And they do what he commands. Does that make sense? His body. His body. You know, if I were to go out and walk through the field and find a severed arm out there, I'm not going to go, oh, this is part of my body. (laughs) No, my body is connected to me in union with me. And if people don't believe that which puts them in union with Christ, they cannot claim they are his body. Number two, what is church membership? What is a church? And now let's ask, what is church membership? In this, we will have a little bit more scripture to look at. Go to Acts chapter 2, if you would. We can see from the behavior of the apostles that they believed in church membership. After Christ preached, or after Peter preached the sermon at Pentecost, we read this in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And the church gained 3,000 members in one day. And how do we know that? Well, we know that because they took count. They had a role. Paul admits this in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 12, which we looked at several months ago. He says, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. And so there are marks of someone who is in the church and someone who is outside. Someone who is inside, someone who is outside. There has to be some sort of demarcation for people who are in and people who are out, right? There are some in, there are some out. We don't treat the same way those who are in and those who are out. And what do we call that for those who are in? Well, we like the language of Scripture. Ye are members one of another. You know, when we think of membership, a lot of times we think, well, just like the Elk Club or the Eagles Club or something like that. No, no, no. This isn't a membership of a club. We're saying that we are members of the body of Christ. We're members of the body of Christ, and therefore we are members one of another. Our membership has a very spiritual nature to it. But as good stewards, we make a a paper and ink roll as good stewards. The Apostle Paul says the church is like a body with hands, eyes, ears, nose, etc. And how useful is a body that's spread all over town? Imagine if you go to the edge of the driveway and your legs go right and your nose and eyes go left. How far are you going to get? You know, the right half of my body goes right and the left half of my body goes left. The whole thing falls apart. A body finds its, u- its usefulness in its unity, in its togetherness. In Acts 29, uh, I'm wrong about that. Uh, Acts 9, verse 26. Paul had been uh, giving his whole life to the persecution of Christians. In Acts chapter 9, verse 26. And now he's looking for the church, but for a very different reason. It says, and when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed, that is, he attempted to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Well, they had valid reasons to say, we don't want him to join our church. You know, there was a church split in the last 10 churches he attended. And uh, it was a violent thing as women and children and men were yanked out and carried off to court. Uh, we, we We don't really want him to join but you understand he wanted to join himself to the disciples so the question is not should i join to the disciples the the question is what should that joining look like what type of joining is it and and a lot of people have this idea well we have a, a church where it's just basically my wife and my kids and myself and we meet together and and we have devotions you know on saturday or sunday or whatever and that's that's our church 
this assembly, this joining, what level of commitment is it? What's the requirement? And these are things that we'll cover in the weeks to come. But right off the bat, looking at what is church membership, at the very least, it's joining with the disciples of Jesus Christ. Flip over to uh, Acts 20, if you would. In membership, there's accountability. And it ought to fit, I think, the New Testament pictures of body and flock. Look at what the Apostle Paul says in Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, how could a man oversee a flock if he doesn't know which sheep are his? Is that even possible? You know, well, here's, here's a thousand sheep. Go take care of yours. Well, which ones are mine? No, I just, you know, you look for some and, you know, that guy, he'll look, for, he'll look at others. No, no, no. There has to be a specific understanding. There has to be specific boundaries. And church membership helps us. It helps the pastor to know for which sheep he's accountable. It helps the other members in the pew to know for which people we are accountable. Who has God joined to us? What are the members of the body? Now, as a pastor, I've been warned that I'm going to give an account for those people who are a member of my flock. Uh, it's Christ's flock, but I'm shepherding under Christ. In Hebrews 13, verse 17, the Holy Spirit speaks to me and to you. Obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. The church is commanded to obey the leaders in the church. We could say elders. We could say pastors. I, I feel like this is why it would be wise to have a multiplicity of faithful, diligent leaders in the church. Um, I want to personally steer away from this idea that my word is law. I don't want that. I don't mind leading. But I also recognize that there are many men who've been in my situation who have abused power. And I think that a flock could be better cared for, as Paul says in Acts 20, verse 28. The flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. The flock, singular, overseers, plural. Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. For they watch for your souls. Now, church, you're called to submit to leadership. And I've, I, I don't want to be a tyrant. I don't want to lead the church wrong or bad. And I think that there's wisdom in having more. But Hebrews 13 verse 17 also says, You, in order to be an obedient Christian, need to know who your leaders are, right? And you can't say, oh, well, my leaders are, are you know, John MacArthur and, and, you know, my other favorite YouTube pastors and this, this YouTube personality and that guy on TikTok and I like this other guy and they're my leaders. No, 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 no. You cannot submit yourself to a distant shepherd. You cannot you can fool yourself that you are, but you cannot submit yourself. Look, I like Brother MacArthur. He's helped me in a lot of ways. You know he's not perfect. You're supposed to gasp at that. You know he's imperfect, but sometimes all of us perfect people are busy, and so God has to use people who are less than perfect, right? I like him. Let me tell you something. He does not watch for my soul. He doesn't. He does not stay up late at night and pray for me. 
It's a fine man, a good Christian man, believer, preaches the word of God in, in truth and sincerity. He's trustworthy. He doesn't watch for my soul. He doesn't watch for your soul. You know, and whoever it is that you see on Facebook, whoever it is that you see on YouTube, they don't watch for your soul. They don't stay up late. They don't rise up early to pray for your soul. Who does that? I'll tell you who will do it. A faithful elder if you would submit yourself to his flock. You can say amen. <laughs> okay, so Hebrews 13 verse 17 is just assuming. It's just, it's kind of like it's baked in. You're going to find a church with faithful leadership, and you're going to say, I will submit myself here. I will become obedient to the people who have the rule over me so that they can give account of me with joy and they can watch for my soul. That's a big deal. I went to see a dear friend of mine. She was a member here for a lot of years and a good Christian woman. And I visited her several times before she passed away. And I try to make it a point to ask people when they're homebound, when I get to visit them, or when it's obvious they're very sick, are you trusting in the Lord? Are you trusting in the Lord? I know they're not comfortable. And this one lady in particular, I know she was hurting. But I cared for her soul. I wanted to know that she was on her way to see Jesus. Doesn't matter that she went to church for a lot of years. You know, doesn't matter that she sang songs. It doesn't matter that she built her social life around activities in the church. My job is for her soul, right? Hey, the, those internet personalities do not watch for the soul. Membership in a local church is essential to living the Christian life. It's essential. Number three, who can join? Who can join? Well, in one way, there's an impossibly high barrier. You must be born again. An impossibly high barrier. One that God graciously bestows upon people. Now in our church, you can read in our, in our bylaws and other things, we have a helpful addition to the list. It doesn't just say, well, you have to be saved. And we've learned that means many different things to many different people. Well, I'm saved. I spoke in tongues. Okay. Well, I'm saved. I got baptized. Okay. Well, I'm saved. I did this. I did that. We want to know that someone is born again. We want to know that someone is following Christ. The reality is that there are reasons why we would discipline people, right? If somebody would live in fornication, unrepentant, would we allow them to remain a member? That's the question. What's the answer? No, not at all. Scripture is very plain. Cast out the wicked person. Someone says, man, I'm going to live in covetousness. And we say, you really shouldn't live in covetousness. And it doesn't come out that way, but you know, man, all I'm concerned about is the next new thing. And this thing, and I'm going to say, hey, how, how's your soul? How's your walk with Christ? How's your relationship with the Lord? But they're just committed to covetousness. Someone's committed to theft. Someone who is committed to a lifestyle that displeases the Lord. As a church, we have an obligation to say, no, you cannot be a member here. So let's be honest. If someone comes and says, I'd like to join, and they're committed to all of these things or any of these things, I don't think it's unwise to say, no, we don't want you to be a member here. Now, again, unrepentant is different from someone who's struggling. It's a huge difference. Unrepentant is when someone will not speak of their sin as God speaks of it. When God says this is sin and someone says, no, it's not, well, there's a huge problem. In our church, we say if you've been saved and baptized in a church of like faith, then you can join. Why would we put that in there? Baptized in a church of like faith. 
Well, you understand in Acts chapter 2, it says, they that gladly received his word and were baptized, then they were added to the church. Why go in that order? Because baptism is the first step of obedience. There's an understanding that when someone comes to faith, they're going to want to please him. And what is the first thing he commanded us to do? To be baptized, to show your faith. And so I think there's an understanding. Saved people are those who know and love Jesus. We're all growing at different rates. Paul told Timothy about this. He said, those who are weak in the faith receive not with doubtful disputation. So someone may come and they're weak in the faith. The important part is in the faith. Are they in Christ? Do they have evidence that they've been born again? It is in the church's best interest to remain in fellowship with the Father. And if the Father reveals that someone is unsaved, we do not want them as part of the church. We don't want unregenerate people claiming that they represent Jesus Christ in the world. Would you agree with that? Do you think it's good for the testimony of Christ if unsaved people can stand up and say, we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We are the representatives for Jesus Christ. Is that wise? Is it healthy? Is it good for the gospel? Is it good for the lost? In all things, it's unloving. It's unloving. Now, we want people to attend who are not saved. We want them here. We want people who, to attend who are uh, antagonistic to the gospel. We want people to attend who are interested and curious about the gospel. We want uh, young people, people young in the faith, who are coming. We want people who are considering church membership. We want people who are not considering church membership. We want people who are members. We want all of those people to be here with us. But the membership is different from the attendance. We want many people here. I think that a healthy church generally will have people at all different stages edifying and helping and encouraging each other um, during their gatherings. But we only accept those into membership who, according to Acts 2.21, have gladly received his word and been baptized. Now, I'll finish, this with, finish with this for now, but I want to mention uh, that you might be greatly helped by an article on the back table that I printed out for you by Jonathan Lehman called 12 Reasons Why Membership Matters. If you've not taken one of those little half pages front and back, if you've not taken it and read it, I want to encourage you, take it. Take a copy. Read it today. Read it before the sun goes down. You will be helped by it, and it will help you to think through some of these things biblically. And then lastly, I'm going to run down the next lessons in this series. I'll give you uh, kind of my syllabus. And I thought about typing it out, but um, you could just listen and maybe get a feel for what we're doing. There's this message on church membership, kind of an introductory thought. The next four are also introductory. Number one is going to be healthy members, healthy churches. Healthy members, healthy churches. Then, what makes membership meaningful? Then, what about pastors, elders, and teachers? That's the next message. And then the message after that is, what about deacons? Boy, and I'll really get you that. No, I'm just kidding. And then there are 13 commitments that a church must have. A church must have these 13 commitments. I want to be faithful to them. And I want you to help me be faithful to them. And I want you to be faithful to them. And I want to help you. I want us to help each other. Here they are. The first commitment is to the glory of God. The next three commitments are all to the word. And what I mean by to the word, I mean gospel. I mean doctrine. And I mean faithful, expository proclamation. So, commitment number one, to the word of God. Commitment number two, to the word. Uh, number one, to the glory of God. Number two, to the word, that is gospel. 
Commitment number three, a commitment to the word doctrine. And number four, a commitment to the word. And in each of these, I mean the scripture. Faithful, expository proclamation of the scripture. Then we have several commitments to our homes. Number five, personal sanctification. You know, our our homes should be helped by the church. And our church cannot be what it ought to be unless our homes are what they ought to be. Number six, another commitment to our home, private devotions. Private devotions. Then we have four commitments to the assembly. They are attendance, prayer, exhortation, and discipline. And then three commitments to the world. Personal evangelism, care for the weak, and missions. And I intend for each of these to be shorter messages. And you can see how that's going. (laughs) We're starting off wrong. But uh, with truth. And that is what I'm concerned about. And may God help us to love the church as Christ loved the church. And may Christ use us as his body to build one another up in love.